Hi, I'm Joyce Krieger and this is ArtLink, conversations with artists, designers, art consultants, art lovers, and art collectors. My guest today is Leslie Saul. She is the owner of Leslie Saul & Associates in Cambridge, Mass., and in Miami, Florida. Leslie comes to us with years of experience in the design field. She has a degree in architecture, design, and fine arts. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming tonight. Leslie, how did a young woman decide to start out on her own with her own firm? This is always something that is curious to me because it takes a lot of guts. I know you've had some experience in the architectural field before, but all of a sudden you decided to march out on your own. What was that like for you? Starting my own business was um, really surprising in that everyone I told said, oh, you're going to be such a success. You're going to be such a success. And I said, how do you know? It was very shocking because to me it didn't seem like a sure thing. And I think that often that stops people who would be very good at running their own businesses, but they think, I can't do it, I can't do it. And I think fear of failure is still a motivator for me, which is kind of interesting after 21 years in a business that has paid many mortgages and salaries over the years for, for the employees that have worked for me. Um, it's funny to think about fear of failure as, as a motivator. Well, I think, you know, as a woman, I can only tell you that there have been many times in my life and businesses that I've started where I have felt like a fraud. I just haven't felt that I could do it, and I think it does hold us back. But you've been a tremendous success. You've had all different types of clients. I was on your website. You've had law firms. You've had accounting firms. You've had just about everything. Tell us about some of your clients. Well, we say that we want to, the, we want to use architecture and interior design uh, to make the world a better place for people who work, play, age, live, and learn. So work is all of our corporate interiors work. Play is retail, restaurants, that kind of work. Age is kind of what it sounds like, senior living. Um, a friend in Miami was like, oh, don't use the word age. Age is, no one wants to age. And I said, well, they may not want to, but we do. And so I want to make it a nicer experience for those people who age. And then live is private homes primarily, but we also have a, a strong affordable housing component of that piece of live and, of course, learn. Um, we all live and learn, but I think that learn is also the academia, um, and we've also thrown in our synagogues and churches into sort of the learn point uh, part of the practice. So it's a broad practice. I'm slightly ADD, so this is perfectly suited for me to have lots of different kinds of clients, lots of different kinds of challenges. And when I first started the business, speaking back at the beginning, um, I really had I'd come from a firm where everything was siloed and the idea was you know when you talk to an academic institution you only do academic projects when you talk to someone who's doing a private home you specialize in private homes and then in 1997 we we had our first website which at the time was very avant-garde to have a website in 1997 it's not that long ago but it it was it was um, unusual and I realized the cat would be out of the bag because we were going to have to show synagogues and corporate work and private homes and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and what we found is that in practice, as well as from a marketing point of view, it enhances, the, the, the lines have become blurry over time. Now we talk about offices that people spend more time in than home anyway, so we want to make them more homey and warmer. And, and certainly senior living, why should old people not have beautiful homes that not old people have and you can just take any category and, and in fact on the blog we've been playing a little bit with that you know designing a chapel in a university designing a library in a in a law firm so the crossover is quite fun and I think that's why people stay working with me for a long time my first employee from 21 years ago still is with me as you know I'm all about art 
you're all about design and you're about art too because I know you're passionate about art. And you've incorporated art in a lot of your projects, whether they've been pieces that you've inherited from the company or whether you've introduced new pieces. Tell me a little bit about what it's like to commission a piece of art for a specific space. Well, I am a big proponent of commissioning art. I think that an artist, an artist's work may resonate with you, with the client, and it feels like um, it's the right match from a spiritual point of view, if I can use that word, or a, for whatever intuitive reason, it feels like the right thing. Um, yet the space that you have to display this art might be smaller, bigger, rounder, lit well, not lit well, you know, whatever the conditions of the architecture are that make the art that exists by that artist to be um, not appropriate. And I often, the other thing I love is that when you commission an art, you can get the artist will come and look at your space and sometimes have a completely different location they want to put their, their piece. Artists sometimes have good ideas, whether the artist is right or wrong, at least it's a good discussion. And also, sometimes the artist is inspired by the architecture in a way that is different um, from the way I maybe look at things. And I just found out that one of the projects in, that we did, uh, we just recently renovated a lobby space for 99 Bedford in downtown Boston. And the client wanted to get rid of this very interesting sculpture on the wall. And um, I said, now this is fantastic because the artist is talking about the era of the architecture and it just resonates for me and we'll work around that and, and celebrate it. And I found out it, you actually placed that art in that building. Many Can you years, tell me about it? Many years ago, this was a commission from an artist named Sam Gallo who has since passed away. And he took some of the friezes off the old South Church and recreated them so that there was a little story about a bird chasing or a squirrel or some kind of an animal chasing a bird. And at the end of this freeze, he reconstructed the freeze so that the animal actually caught the bird. So it was, it was a kind of a cute little scenario on an H.H. H. Richardson building. And I think that your story is actually very relevant to me because especially in contemporary art, now this art is, uh, has, it's rooted enough in tradition that I don't think you need an explanation, but often, especially in contemporary art, the, um, the explanation gives, suddenly makes the whole thing come to life when you realize what the artist was trying to do. And so if you're just going through and saying, oh, that's pretty, that's the right color, our sofa's blue, so we want a blue in our painting, you're not going to get the intellectual layering of that piece that actually makes the whole appreciation of the piece more significant, more deep. I think this is, well, this is why art is so important to me, um, because basically with budgets as they are today, the spaces that we end up with are maybe not as interesting as we would love them to be until the art comes in and we can take we can transform a rather ordinary or lovely space or maybe not so lovely space and transform it into something that is uh, really important and and has meaning and value to the people who walk by it and see it and and so for me I think um, and this, this actually applies for as a critic when I get asked to be a guest critic and I hear uh, guest critics come and they go, oh, I don't like green. Why did you use green? And I'm thinking, that is not what a job of a critic is not to tell the person what you would have liked. The question is, what did the artist, what did the architect set out to accomplish and are we achieving that? And sometimes the art can interpret that for us in a way that the architecture by itself can't do. That brings up something interesting. When I was looking at your website, I noticed, and I'm looking at the way you're dressed, color is critical Color's to your critical design. To Talk to me a little bit about how that came about. I mean, there's designers like Andre Pittman who only design in black and white. Yes. Leslie Saul uses... Didn't matter when beige was in style. Well, I'm not a into fashion trends per se anyway um, in terms of use of color when everybody thought what's beautiful is beige I thought 
that's boring. just boring. That's not really interesting. It doesn't say anything about anyone's character. Now, that doesn't mean you need to like hot pink to work with me, although um, you have to be open-minded for hot pink. I had a client once who said, I hate green, and I made sure that I put green chairs in his office to prove to him that you can't hate a color. It's how that color can have impact in the space, what it else it's working with, and I just refuse to to write off any color. But you know, we only have so many tools in our tool belt as designers. We have light, we have color, we have texture, we have the space itself. You know, there's only so much we can do. So if we're not if we're ignoring one of the big elements, which is color, or light, this is another thing that I don't think designers spend enough time on. Uh, they might spend a fortune on some beautiful chandelier, but then you can't see the art on the wall because it's a cave inside, you know, that kind of situation. Leslie, when you start with a new client, let's say it's not a bid situation, you're, you're hired. Where do you start with them? Do you work with them individually, as a group? What do you talk about? How do you begin? Because I know you're the best at this. I love the beginnings. I do feel that this is something I'm really gifted at is the starting of things. And I'm always surprised when people have trouble starting because that's easy for me. And if I have one idea, I have 100 ideas. And um, so I do, the space itself generates lots of ideas. But really what I love is learning about the people because for me, architecture is not about the building as much as it is about the people. So how do you get to know who the people are? especially with the diverse clientele we have. So when it's a corporate client um, or a synagogue, I would say those two and primarily, and sometimes academics, uh, sometimes they don't want to deal with this, but we really start with some kind of a visioning session. To sit down, and I have a whole technique of how we create this shared vision. How does that work? That sounds, <laughs> I mean, that's something I'd like you to share because people well, are, always interested in how you get this information out and how you move forward with it. My experience is there are people like you and me who are not afraid to talk. And we can dominate a process that maybe allows people who are quieter, or doesn't allow people who are quieter to have a say, who might actually have brilliant ideas, but they're not going to interrupt us, whereas we're happy to interrupt each other. We have confidence, we're verbal, whatever. So I thought, how do I make sure that the nonverbal people who still have a lot going on in their heads share it with us as part of the group? And I came up with this idea that if everyone has to write things down, then whether you're quiet or noisy, you all get the same input into the process. And I used to use big index cards. Now I use big Post-its. And we together with the leadership of the group, so it could be the president of a company, the, it could be the chair of the committee on a, in a synagogue, we ask what are the questions we want to ask, we settle that ahead of time, and we ask questions of this group. I've done as big as 50 people, but... Um, and you don't get a camel, like the horse that was designed by a committee? No, it's very interesting, <laughs> and the process is amazing that it works. You, you, maybe I don't want to get into the whole thing, the details of it, but Everyone participates. We write a single phrase or word on each of these cards. We bring them to the front and we organize them and we keep organizing them and keep sorting them and ask the people, do you think this card goes in this bunch? Do you think this card's? And it is Can you truly give me an amazing. example of like one so or two of these? So let's say the question is, what adjective do you want the visitor to your office or the new potential employee to your office? or the uh, potential member of your congregation, what do you want, what adjectives would you want them to use when they describe the space when they walk in? What's that first impression? And I d actually a synagogue popped into my head where one of the, uh, it kind of came down to two camps. One wanted it warm and comfortable like your grandmother's kitchen, mm -hmm. and the other wanted soaring and impressive like you know, my feeling of God is on high. So how do you and get those two to, to talk to well, each other we, and come to a decision? The, so when we normally do something where we kind of come down to five categories, that all of the answers come into five categories, I know it's hard to believe that you could have 150 responses that end up in five categories, but it's true. And then we might vote, and everyone has five stickers, and they can put all five stickers on one thing that resonates with them, or they can put one sticker on each of five things. And sometimes they'll give the rabbi five extra, or they'll give the secretary five extra, because she really knows what everyone wants. So um, 
the votes help that maybe narrow from five to two. In this case, we got to two pretty easily, but nobody was willing to give up. So you're still at grandmother's kitchen still and soaring. Still at grandmother's kitchen and soaring. So we ended up with a kind of a big barn archy space, but all in wood. So, so the, that accommodated the cozy. So it was cozy enough and it was soaring enough that people felt like they had been listened to. And in fact, they had been listened to. And of course, it was also rooted in tradition of the great wooden architect, uh, wooden synagogues of Europe. So there was a, it, it, there was a precedent it may be accomplished both, and the people in that congregation uh, have continued to be very happy in it. They had talked to other architects, which is, here's a little space planning nugget. Uh, they had talked to another architect who is well known, and he was putting like little additions here, there, and the other place to try to accommodate all of the programmatic requirements that they had. And we sat there and said, you know, why don't you just start over with the sanctuary, do one big thing that you can do well, and then take the old sanctuary, make it a social hall because they wanted a social, you know, make, keep, renovate the pieces that are left to the lesser programmatic requirements and make a new synagogue, you know, do one thing. And that was actually at a recession, we were lucky on that in terms of pricing, but doing one thing well is better than lots of little stuff and, and I'm sure you can feel this way on the art side but on the architecture side it works as well. So you referred several times to synagogues. I know there was one that you have talked to me about at length. Could you tell us a little bit about that project? That project is the Young Israel of New Rochelle, New York. It took 13 years from the time they wanted to build the synagogue until they were completed. Graham Gund was the architect and worked with them for about nine years before I got involved. Um, and I immediately brought in two artists, Faye Grayjower, who has a tremendous background in um, Holocaust art. Uh, she's exhibited widely in Europe, actually. And Munya Upin, who is a modern silversmith. And if you know Graham Gund's work, it's very airy and um, light and in a this is modern orthodox there are two sanctuaries a large sanctuary and a small chapel that's a daily study kind of place which is cozier and so Faye's work which is um, depth rich and depth on in painting also does some back painted glass and other things so so the chapel has Faye's uh, Ner Tamid and Faye's um, Mezuzot the, at the door, entry doors, and uh, Munya did the main sanctuary, the Erner Tamid and the Mezuzot. So you have this modern, clean silver and smith. And I just had this vision, like from the moment I started looking at where their plans were at that moment, I knew that these two artists would just help make this synagogue um, have character, have the character that the architect intended too, because some of that is my some of my vision has to also include the architect, not just the client, as we just discussed. Well, Graham is a big art collector, so I'm sure he was. Well, he had actually collected one of Faye's pieces before he, I, uh, she w was on the um, committee on the Young Israel of Brookline. Oh. After the fire, they built and they hired Graham Gund, and he actually had one of her drawings, which I thought was interesting. And um, that's how I met her. So when, when it was time to do the the newer shell, I, I just knew that would make it. And for me, the architecture is terrific, the, and it's simple, and the, the art is just appropriate and perfect. And, you know, it doesn't mean that it's the only thing one sees, but together the experience, I think, is really quite great. And they have now, only a few years later, they've outgrown. It's, they doubled the capacity of their old place, maybe even tripled it, and they've even outgrown it. And so I think architecture does matter. It's the same rabbi. It's the, this idea that you have this place that you can, that has the right adjectives, you know, those, those feelings, those adjectives that you want to use if you think back to those visioning sessions. When they come to life and they work, that it, people want to be there. Now, you talked about awards. You've gotten a lot of awards in your life. Is there one you're the most proud of? Oh, what a great question. Um, I really loved the uh, response to the award. I won the, 
entrepreneurship of the year, entrepreneur of the year for New England women in real estate. And uh, it's selected by your peers, so that's a fun thing. Uh, maybe it was my turn, and maybe I didn't deserve it, but uh, you're given two minutes to give a speech of thank you speech. And I decided to talk about entrepreneurship as someone who wears a lot of hats. And I looked at my wardrobe. I don't have that many hats. And I tried to think, oh, I'll go to a vintage place. I wanted a prop. So I had decided I had to make my hats because I couldn't mm -hmm. find the hats. So I went to Paper Source and bought all kinds of crazy colors and textures of paper and designed hats that I was putting on. And, and Gail Huff was the MC, and she would take the hat. She would just be so excited about this. So her enthusiasm and my props have had a resonance over the years that's unbelievable. I ran into someone, they go, I You're remember the hat lady. you. You had that amazing speech. I don't even know if they remember the hats, but they remember that it was an experience. In two minutes, you can do it. That same night, a woman gave 15 minute speech for her two minutes. Oh, wow. You don't need 15 minutes. To get your point across. To get your point across. And people don't prepare. Talk to me a little bit about the UMass Dartmouth project that you did. The UMass Dartmouth project, I don't know if anyone has been down to um, UMass Dartmouth, but it's worth a visit. It was designed by Paul Rudolph, and uh, he was a well-known brutalist architect. What is brutalism? I meant so to ask you that. Brutalism is exposed concrete in a oh. simplified way. And there are many examples in Boston. Government Center. Government Center has is a bru somewhat brutalist building. The um, it's a little later. The um, there is an actual Rudolph uh, Church and a Rudolph. Uh, I think the Department of Mental Health or something is in a brutalist building. And this whole campus was planned, and all of the buildings have a certain aesthetic, which is you know dominated by this raw concrete. Well, when Cold. you Cold very, very rough. So UMass Dartmouth is a planned community, planned by Paul Rudolph. All of the buildings are in this style, this brutalist style with exposed concrete, although this particular one has a corduroy effect around a lot of the interior parts of the building uh, literally have formed inside a form. So the concrete isn't rough like if you're gonna rip your clothes when you get next to it. It's a more of a smoother and he did this, and he also did the kind that are chipped out. But this particular one is the smooth kind. And lots and lots and lots of raw concrete. And Paul Rudolph himself understood that when you have all of this raw concrete, you need to balance that with some color. And his own color palette in this project and in other projects uh, were the inspiration for the color palette, which includes hot pink, uh -huh. orange, um, purple, reds, uh, you know, all of these warm colors. So you had to work with his color palette? Well, we were, we were inspired by his color palette, basically, um, because he was right. You needed those hot colors to go against that rough tone, cool tones of the, of the concrete. And over time, as people had redecorated, as the building was built, you know, in, was designed in the late 60s, actually, you end up with a gray carpet because that's what people did was gray carpet. So now you have a building that's gray with gray carpet and everyone hates it. Now we've transformed the space to architecture firms, the lead, the executive architect design lab in Boston and uh, doing the new addition as well. And then the other architect, Jonathan Austin's firm in Cambridge who doing the, um, the renovation of the, the library, which was the bulk of the, of the project. And then we worked on the interiors for both of them. And a, a Design Lab really uh, was the lead, I would say, on this project, but they, um, which just won another, it's won dozens and dozens of awards right now um, and published multiple places. But what was the reason it's prize winning is because you, for me, isn't the, isn't the recognition from IIDA, which is lovely, but to me what's, what's really exciting about it is that this space was, I'm going to call the population at peak usage 3,000 students. It, on a regular day, can get 6,000 students going to this library. 
because now it's attractive. Attractive is a word that I love because it's attracting people into the space and using it. And their heads are down and they're looking at work and they're doing group study and they're doing all these things that a library can do for students um, on a campus. And uh, I, we saw the comments and the students are asking, you know, can you take these colors elsewhere on the campus? Can you change the graphics elsewhere? You couldn't find your way around. And the graphic designer did such an amazing job on this. The uh, um, lighting designer was brilliant and, and created some light uh, fixtures that are based on some Rudolph fixtures. So we were all inspired by the original architect, but interpreting them with new ideas, new colors, um, but in that palette. When I proposed a shocking pink table in a library, I thought, they're going to think I'm nuts. But that photograph of that pink table is used all over the place. People love it. That must be very rewarding for And it's you. just, well, to me, the reward is just seeing the students love it and the librarians. We touched a little bit about the internet earlier in our conversation. Oh, yeah. How do you see the internet five, ten years from today impacting the design industry? Well, I mean, the good news is that ideas can travel quickly. I just saw this profile of a artist who in who was saying uh, he's a flamenco dancer but he apparently has influences of everything else that's going on from hip hop to uh the twist in his dancing but he's still a flamenco dancer and he said well I go to the movies I'm on the internet I of course I'm going to so they're inspiring to absorb it and change and the and life is good, change is good. So um, yes, I believe in classical architecture and modern architecture and postmodern architecture because change is good, it, it's okay. And, and let's, let's be influenced by others. Let's look at Pinterest and Howes as enemies or let's look at them as opportunities to get educated and share ideas. And I don't feel like I have a lock on all the great ideas. I love, con I love when an engineer pipes up in a meeting with a great idea that, you know, everyone, oh, engineers, you know, they don't understand. But sometimes they do have great ideas, and everyone has good ideas. A homeowner, I don't, I don't want it to feel like it's so esoteric what I do that I don't want people to open up their mouths. I want to create an environment where everyone feels worthy of being part of the process. So you're inspired now by everything that you see from what I hear. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like you walk I, out in the I, road and you're inspired from the morning true. till night. It's true. I, I, I got asked that question from the BSA when they did a profile of me. And, and I said I was actually inspired. I reread that interview as part of my preparation for this. And I said that I had seen this old person serving coffee um, you know, t uh, as a retiree, taking this extra job, waking up early in the morning, going to this diner, and pouring coffee with a huge smile on his face. And I thought, like, that's inspiring. So, would you please you finish go. this sentence for me? Art is. Art is soul. Art is important. Art is who I am. I love it. Thank you so much. This was a great interview. We had a wonderful conversation, and I look forward to doing another one down the road. Thank you so much, Joyce.